Hey everyone, I'm Allison Mars. We are watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. We are at a very different point in the pandemic than we were a couple of months ago. We have ample vaccine. We have ample uh, uh, experts. We have ample resources to provide them. 70% of U.S. adults now have at least one COVID shot, but more than 35 million have gotten sick. What else the White House and the COVID task force are saying about the pandemic today? Over on Capitol Hill, Senator Lindsey Graham says he has COVID. So how's he doing? And is the Senate thinking twice about masking? Coronavirus cases up more than 140 percent in Nebraska in just the last two weeks. Hospital ICUs there are filling up for the first time in months. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster is outside Nebraska Medical in Omaha. So, Shaq, I understand that hospital just opened up two new COVID wards. You've been speaking with doctors there. What are they saying about the surge in cases? They're saying it's only continuing and only getting worse. Just look at the numbers that they have. It was about a month ago when they only had three COVID patients. They thought they were moving on from this virus. They said the hospital was still full for other ailments and other conditions, but they were moving on beyond this COVID pandem pandemic. Uh, now they have 30 people, 30 patients that they're dealing with at least. And that's a number that continues to grow at this point. And there's that mounting frustration that they're dealing with, especially when you consider the fact that this is largely avoidable at this point. I want you to listen to how a doctor put it to me just this morning. We are far from seeing the worst here in Nebraska really? and across most of the country. And unfortunately for uh, a significant portion of the U.S. Uh, where vaccination rates are low, this is probably going to be the worst phase of the pandemic. It's incredibly frustrating that we have the, the solution to the pandemic in our, in our hands. We really could just reach out and grab it. We just need enough people to go get vaccinated. The big question is, when will this surge end? We know that cases usually usually lead to more hospitalizations. And in the past two weeks, you've seen an increased number of cases here in the state of Nebraska. So that's the frustration. That is a concern, especially when you consider that school will be starting in just a few weeks, Allison. Yeah, a scary thought for a whole lot of parents. Shaq, less than 50 percent of people in Nebraska fully vaccinated. Governor Pete Ricketts won't bring back mask rules. He's saying the CDC needs to, quote, stop trying to tell people how to live their lives. So let's talk more about that. You mentioned it. We're approaching the start of the school year. Yeah, the governor rejecting the mask uh, advice and the new guidance from the CDC saying he is not going to impose a mask mandate in this state. He's saying it's about personal accountability, that people know how to behave essentially in this pandemic. We also know that over the course of the weekend, his emergency orders uh, lapsed. He's not extending them. So the emergency orders that helped control the virus and con control the spread and gave more resources to different areas, uh, those also went away over the course of the weekend. When you listen to doctors, and the, what they're seeing and the surge they're seeing in the hospitals, they're saying, look, despite what you're hearing from government officials, despite what you're hearing from even the CDC, do what you need to do and do what you know uh, helps stop the spread. Listen to how a doctor put it in terms of the school year starting in just a few weeks here. It just kind of frustrates me that we're talking about having to make our kids mask up to mitigate community spread when the real answer is able-bodied adults need to get vaccinated, then we wouldn't have to be even having this conversation about schools. So it's crazy to me that that's our sort of plan of action to protect the community. It's masking the kids for the adults that refuse to vaccinate. It seems insane. That's an ICU physician right there. He says that the majority of the patients he's seen are unvaccinated. He said uh, during the search, he's only seen two who were vaccinated and they had other comorbidities, comorbidities going on there. One question I did ask him, I, I said, you know, of the patients that he's seeing and that he's interacting with, uh, how many of them are expressing regret for not getting that vaccination? And he said, look, by the time they get to me, they're on ventilators. They have a tube down their throat. So I'm not hearing much from them. The big point get vaccinated. That's uh, how you avoid the masks. That's how you stop the spread that we're seeing here in Nebraska. Yeah, there in Nebraska and in plenty of other places around the country. Shaq, stay safe out there. Thanks for your reporting. Right. There's a world of hurt happening now in Florida, Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri that could have been prevented. It's heartbreaking now. These stories of people in the ICU saying, oh, I wish I'd gotten vaccinated a 
final text message from a 39-year-old father to his wife saying, I wish I'd gotten the vaccine just before he died. Isn't that enough to wake people up? The director of the NIH sounding the alarm as the U.S. tops 35 million COVID cases. Florida, now the epicenter of the pandemic here in the U.S., breaking its hospitalization record again today and leading the country in new cases, 21,000 plus on Saturday. NBC News reporter Vaughn Hilliard is in Jacksonville. Vaughn, we know the Delta variant is driving cases through the roof in Florida and across the country. You were inside a local hospital. What are they seeing there? Yeah, they're seeing an inundation of, uh, of patients that they frankly haven't seen in any of the three previous, pre, uh, three previous waves here. You're talking about this hospital behind us here with 220 plus COVID patients inside. Back in June, it was 14. Here in the city of Jacksonville, there are already more than 60% over what their previous high was uh, a year ago. You know, you're talking about a state right now in which there are more than 10 thousand residents, more than 10,000 residents inside of Florida hospitals here. And what other we should note is that the makeup here of who are these people, you're talking about a media, uh, 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 an average age of 43 years old. This is no longer just older folks being impacted here. You're talking about individuals in their 20s and their 30s and their 40s here. I want to let you hear from one man who is 67 years old, uh, Lawrence. And I actually was sitting outside of his door here inside of this Jacksonville hospital as we FaceTimed uh, through the door. I want to let you hear his message here because he is unvaccinated himself, but he's been here now for 22 days and his story is a little different. Please do not play. Get a vaccination. If I would have been so stupid and got my vaccination, I wouldn't even been in this predicament. Everybody, don't listen to no foolishness. Go get vaccinated. Allison, you've got to look at that data there, and Lawrence is just one of thousands of Floridians that find themselves in this hospital. Again, he's been there for 22 days. But I think what is so striking when you look at the trajectory and look at the uh, the extent to which this uh, mm. these numbers hospitalizations have jumped in the last month is remarkable because just four weeks ago, there were 2,000 COVID patients in the hospital. Now, over 10,000. It's just a stunning increase here in which hospital officials only expected to get worse. Yeah, those numbers are unbelievable. Vaughn, one of Florida's largest healthcare systems, suspending non-emergency surgeries to free up resources for COVID patients. This sounds like last year all over again. We know most of the people in the hospital with COVID are unvaccinated. So how's the state doing with its vaccinations right now? You know, that's one piece of, I guess, somewhat encouraging news. Over the course of the last three weeks, there's been a 78% jump in vaccinations here in Florida. That is good news here. At the same time, there is 50% of the adult population is still not fully vaccinated. So we are talking about seven, eight million people here in just Florida that are unvaccinated. We are so far away from herd immunity here that you gotta get more than a 78% jump here. As you watch Delta variant ramp up here, the, you know, it's interesting talking to two of the nurses here, uh, nurses Debbie and Sabrina, they were saying the number of folks that come in and say, can we get a shot? At this point, it's too late. It takes that two weeks for a first dose to begin to have any sort of, a, of an effect here. And that is why getting those vaccines into arms is so crucial now here. Of course, July, that was a good uptick, but we need even more here in August, these medical officials say. All right, so Vaughn, you've run us through the numbers and the warnings, but Governor Ron DeSantis, Florida's governor, still opposed to mask mandates, and there are still major events happening in Florida with crowds of people. Uh, check out this pack concert. This was just last night in Miami's Hard Rock Stadium. Uh, our producer who shot the video says very few people were wearing masks. All right, we're not showing that video, but I, there you go. A lot of folks, very few masks. Is there any talk of curtailing these kinds of crowds? Uh, not by Governor DeSantis. Uh, this is the Florida Republican governor has shown uh, no eagerness to uh, get folks to be masked up here. In fact, in May, he actually uh, signed, uh, uh, signed an order that kept local governments from implementing any restrictions or implementing mask mandates. And then he went a step further just three days ago, knowing that these number of hospitalizations were increasing, knowing that the number of cases 
were jumping up. He signed an order here just one week out from when students are supposed to be re-entering the schools, barring school districts from requiring their students to wear masks to school. So this is a governor here uh, that joins the company of Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Arizona Governor Doug Ducey in signing those similar orders, uh, preventing school districts from requiring children to be masked up when we have evidence here that new cases include those individuals younger than 18 years old. Here in the state of Florida, over the last week, about eight, nine percent of the new cases were among kids under the age of 12 years old. And so when you see those images from that concert there. Essentially, we're dealing with a, a moment in which everybody wanted this Renaissance summer to rip off their masks and go about their life. And you see those lawmakers there wanting to pull off any sort of mask mandates or restrictions. At the same time, you're making those decisions while folks inside of these hospitals, these nurses and these doctors are working on who? The unvaccinated individuals who are contracting COVID because of uh, being unmasked and because of the way in which the Delta variant is operating. And that is taking down anybody of any age. We are talking about people in these hospitals that are not just immunocompromised or old. We are talking about 20 year olds, 30 year olds and 40 year olds, Allison. Yeah, they're getting younger and it's a really scary thought. Vaughn, I'm not a parent, but I just can't imagine sending my unvaccinated child out into a world where the Delta variant is ripping through right now without putting a mask on them. It just uh, is a little too frightening uh, for me. Vaughn Hilliard in Florida. Thank you so much, my friend. Thanks, my friend. Let's bring in Dr. Yvonne Johnson, chief medical officer at Baptist Health South Miami Hospital. Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for being with us. I know you are so busy there. You told a local station the number of patients in your COVID ward has quadrupled in the last three weeks and all of them unvaccinated. Talk to us about how challenging it's been for your staff these last few weeks. And what is your message for people who are still hesitant to get this vaccine? Well, first of all, thank you for having me and highlighting this really important topic. Uh, that was last week when I said our, we had quadrupled. If I look at the numbers this week, compared to the beginning of the month of July, starting now the beginning of the month of August, we have five times the number of patients across our health system who are in the hospital. And among those who are the sickest in our ICUs, zero have been vaccinated. So this is a completely preventable aspect of the pandemic right now. All of these uh, very sick patients and those who may perish, those were all preventable occurrences. It just so, sounds you know, like things are message, only getting worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So my, my message is really to, to those who have been hesitant you know, I think the scale of, of decision making has changed and it is there's just nothing that um, should be preventing people from getting vaccinated. Uh, as you mentioned earlier on the program, we are seeing younger and younger people. We have people in our ICU who are in their 30s and 40s. We have people hospitalized in their 20s. And um, I understand that uh, in the pediatric facilities um, in our county, that they are seeing more and more pediatric patients requiring hospitalization for COVID as well. So no one is um, safe from this virus without having been vaccinated. And that's what we know that this vaccine does is prevent people from dying from COVID-19. No stronger message uh, or, or supporting reason to get a vaccine uh, than that. That's about as good as it gets. It'll keep you alive. Uh, Dr. Florida just set a new record for hospitalizations. People are lining up again to get tested at drive through sites. So what it looked like at Hialeah this morning. Uh, it's similar to what we were seeing in this country a year ago. Based on what's going on in your state, in your hospital, do you think our country needs to increase COVID testing? Is that a real important component here? I think the biggest component is getting vaccinated. You know, I think people, yeah. if they have symptoms, um, it may be important to know if you have COVID because there are some strategies that we can employ to help mitigate people from getting ill if they um, have a, a case of COVID. So I certainly encourage people to get tested if they're symptomatic. But I think the biggest thing that we can do with the resources that we have is to vaccinate our population. 
Dr. Johnson, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis banning mask ma mandates in school. Uh, Congressman Carlos Jimenez, the former mayor of Miami-Dade County, is backing that decision. Here he is. I think uh, the governor is absolutely correct. Uh, I think it would be up to the parents. I think what we need to do is send the message that we want everybody to be vaccinated. Uh, the mask wearing is maybe a false sense of security. I always felt that once the vaccine was available and everybody had access to the vaccine, I think we should need to shut our mask. Miami-Dade County has the fourth largest school district in our country. The superintendent reconsidering its mask policy after the CDC's updated guidance last week. What advice do you have for parents with the new school year just weeks away? What's the best thing they can do to ensure that their kids are safe if they are going back to school? Um, I agree with the CDC guidelines. I think they, they are the uh, public health experts. Um, and certainly the politicians can make decisions about choice. But as a parent, my advice would be to choose to keep your children safe. We know for well over a year, we battled this uh, virus without the benefit of a vaccine for most of us. And we stayed safe by masking. Right now, we know that even people with a vaccine can get infected. We're not gonna get sick and die from it, but you can get infected. And then you can pass it on to those who've not been able to be vaccinated. And you know, our children who are under 12 have not been able to be vaccinated. So my advice would be when they're inside, in congregated areas like school, I would mask and follow the CDC guidelines for, for those, uh, uh, those circumstances. All right, well, doctor, we hear the phone ringing. We know you're busy. We know your hospital is busy. Your ICUs are packed. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today and for sharing the important message uh, that vaccinations can keep you out of a hospital and keep you alive and masks can protect your kids in school. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. All right, it's time to check in with NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce. She has the latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Simone, what's up? Hey, Allison. All right, we are going to start in New York City, where at least 10 people were shot in what police are calling a gang attack. The NYPD releasing video showing the masked gunman opening fire on a crowd in Queens before fleeing. Police say at least three victims are known gang members, and they're believed to be the intended targets. The seven other victims were bystanders. All 10 people are expected to recover. So far, no arrests have been made there. All right, actor Matt Damon facing backlash after admitting in an interview that he only recently stopped using a homophobic slur because his daughter told him to. He says his daughter wrote him what he called a treatise explaining how the word is dangerous after um, using it in a context that he says was a joke. Now, representatives for Damon did not respond to a request for comment. Well, it's official. Bill and Melinda Gates are divorced. A Washington state court approved the divorce today, ending the couple's 27 year marriage. Now, they will continue to run the Gates Foundation together. Decisions on their property division were outlined in a separation agreement that was not included in today's court filing. And digital payment company Square Inc. is now acquiring the buy now, pay later service Afterpay. Square, which allows retailers to accept credit card payments through a device that plugs into a smartphone or a tablet, says they will integrate Afterpay so that customers can pay for goods in installments without relying on credit cards. Now, the all stock deal is valued at $29 billion and is expected to close in early 2022. And lastly, comedian Kathy Griffin shared sharing a very personal health battle. The 60-year-old revealing in a social media post that she has lung cancer and is undergoing surgery for that. Griffin, who never smoked, says doctors are optimistic that the cancer is only stage one and is contained to her left lung. Now, Griffin has recently opened up about her career and mental health following the major backlash she faced after posting a gruesome image of a bloodied head that resembled then-President Donald Trump. Hard to forget those images, Allison, but uh, we wish her a speedy recovery. That's awful. Yeah, absolutely. We hope she's in good health again soon. Simone, thanks so much.
We have the full text of the massive infrastructure package, all 2,702 pages of it. But when will Congress actually pass the bill? Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer pressing his Senate colleagues to get moving. I'd encourage senators from both sides of the aisle to submit potential amendments to the bill. Let's start voting on amendments. The longer it takes to finish the bill, the longer we'll be here. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Hake here now. Garrett, we thank you for taking a break from reading all 2,700 pages of this bill to talk to us. Uh, so when are you expecting a vote and what's in it? The speed reading classes I've been taking really coming in handy this week. Look, uh, yeah. this bill is... <laughs> This bill is massive, $550 billion of new yeah. spending. It's got $110 billion for things like roads and bridges, other major construction projects, $66 billion for Amtrak alone. That's the biggest single investment in passenger rail ever in this country. $25 billion for airports. That'll come to good news, as anybody who's tried to fly this summer can imagine. Now, as for the timeline, the goal for Senate Democrats was to get this thing voted on perhaps by midweek, but everything about this process has been slower than they would like. We're not even going to see the First Amendment uh, votes happening until later this evening. And for Senate Republicans who don't want to see uh, the reconciliation bill coming down the pike after this bill, that's just fine. Here's what Mitch McConnell said on the floor this morning. Our full consideration of this bill must not be choked off by any artificial timetable that our Democratic colleagues may have penciled out for political purposes. So the Senate's supposed to go on recess on Friday, Allison. It looks increasingly unlikely they will have this work finished by then. And Chuck Schumer, the majority leader, says they're not going home until they do. Well, that might light a little bit of a fire. Uh, Garrett, some separate news today. I understand Senator Lindsey Graham has tested positive for COVID. He tweeted that out today. Uh, what else do you know there? How's he doing? That's right. He also tweeted that his symptoms were fairly mild and that he knows they would have been worse had he not been vaccinated. Graham is the first so-called breakthrough case in the Senate where the vast, vast majority of members and staff have been fully vaccinated. He was at a party on Saturday night with Joe Manchin and possibly some other senators who are waiting to get word on if any of them have been tested recently, too. Uh, you know, Graham's expected to recover. He says his symptoms are mild. But in a week where every single vote counts, you've got a 60 vote threshold for that infrastructure bill. Graham was expected to be one of those 60. And then potentially all 50 Democrats would be needed for that Democrat-only reconciliation bill they want to work on next. Attendance is going to be critical this week. And Graham says he has to quarantine for 10 days now, Allison. Garrett, any renewed talk about perhaps uh, masking there on the Senate side? I know that hasn't been particularly uh, attractive, if you will. It it has been recommended, but not required. I have mine today with the city of Washington, D.C. putting a mandate back in place for indoor locations. Yeah. That doesn't include the Capitol because it's a separate deal. But I think most of us who now who live in D.C. Yeah. at least have just gotten used to having our masks and wearing them uh, around inside, even here in the Senate uh, going forward. Smart move for sure. Uh, all right. We got a, a little uh, update or the latest in the uh, feuding between House Minority Leader, Leader Kevin McCarthy and Nancy Pelosi. He's taken some heat for joking it would be hard not to hit Nancy Pelosi with the gavel if he became House Speaker. Uh, what's the latest on the drama between these two? Any, any reaction to that one? The Speaker's office responded in the form of a tweet from the Speaker's top spokesman, Drew Hamill, saying this is just not something you joke about with someone, particularly who's someone whose life was threatened on January 6th, uh, that this kind of violent yeah. talk, even as a joke, is totally inappropriate. The enmity between those two politicians, uh, worse than it has, has been in, in quite a long time up here. Uh, McCarthy's office, for what it's worth, has only said that he was obviously joking, but hasn't apologized. All right, Garrett Hake, thank you so very much. You bet. Millions of Americans at risk of losing their homes as the eviction moratorium runs out, and lawmakers scramble to find a solution. NBC News reporter and producer Julie Serkins on Capitol Hill. Hey, Allison, the Biden administration is now asking all landlords to pause on evicting their tenants for 30 days as they scramble to try and find a solution to the eviction moratorium that ended on Saturday night. Now, here in Congress, we have outrage, particularly from progressives, one of them, Cori Bush, over in the House, who has been sleeping on the steps of the Capitol since Friday, demanding that Congress or the White House take action. Here's what she told my colleague Leanne Caldwell earlier today. 
So I know she was saying, you know, we've been saying the same thing. We want the CDC and the White House to go ahead and work together to pin, uh, you know, an eviction moratorium um, and uh, um, getting that executive order done. But we're not just just leaving it on the White House. We're asking for Congress. We're asking House leadership to reconvene us, bring us back, bring us back because this is our job. We can't go on recess. We can't go on vacation when millions of people's lives are at risk. Now, as that blame game ping pongs from one side of Pennsylvania Avenue to the other, there is still no action taken as we are now at two days of these evictions taking place. That moratorium was put in place by Congress earlier last year when they passed the CARES Act at the start of COVID. They've been extending it ever since, and the CDC implemented a policy so that they could then extend it through the duration of the pandemic. Now, when Saturday rolled around, both the White House and Congress were asking one another to extend the moratorium, but after Supreme Court ruled in June stated that the CDC overstepped its boundaries by implementing this policy. Neither side knows which will take action. For now, though, progressives like Cori Bush, who met with uh, Majority Leader Schumer over here in the Senate earlier today, and Vice President Harris to address the issue. She's frustrated from the lack of sleep and from asking for this extension to be put in place by the Democratic-controlled Congress and the White House. Now, she told me and others on our team that she will continue camping out outside of the Capitol with a group of protesters until the White House or Congress takes action as hundreds are being evicted across the country now. Allison. The White House calling this a milestone Monday, announcing today that 70 percent of adults in the U.S. have at least one dose of the covid vaccine. The seven day average of newly vaccinated Americans, the highest it's been since July 4th. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli here with me now. So, all right, Mike, the White House out with some good news today. Vaccinations are up, but that milestone is just about a month late and several states That's in right. this country are battling serious Delta variant outbreaks right now. So how is the administration balancing the positive messaging with the reality that this pandemic is not at all going away, and the unvaccinated are basically keeping it alive. Yeah, Allison. Well, the White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki today, she noted that, yes, they took a little longer than they had hoped uh, to hit that 70 percent goal, but it was an important uh, goal for the White House to set. They wanted to make sure uh, that as many Americans as possible were getting vaccinated. Even when they set that goal, we didn't know about the Delta variant, and that has turned out to be one of the most significant drivers of people getting vaccinated uh, is the fear of this highly transmissible variant uh, that has emerged, especially in those areas in the South where you don't see as high vaccination rates. But uh, at their COVID uh, briefing today, we heard from officials touting the fact that in some of those hardest hit states, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana and Arkansas, they've actually seen significant rises uh, of the vaccination rates in those states. So uh, certainly something that they're uh, touting here today. But there are some, a lot of other questions outstanding, Allison, and we've talked about this, especially this idea of breakthrough cases and whether that really is a severe concern for most Americans. Here uh, is Jen Psaki talking about that at her briefing earlier. Take a listen. That every single piece of available evidence shows that breakthrough infections are rare and mild. Uh, and that is according to a range of data. So according to new research from Kaiser Family Foundation from January to July, the rate of breakthrough cases reported to states is below 1 percent. Now, these breakthrough cases are getting a lot of attention. And you were just talking about one of those high profile ones, Senator Lindsey Graham from South Carolina. And it was important when he put out a statement acknowledging uh, that he has uh, COVID once again, that he said he was glad he got vaccinated uh, because those symptoms that he has now are much milder. The White House certainly appreciated him, including that in the statement. But I want to put an asterisk on what you heard from Saki there. She said all the data that they have is that these cases are limited and aren't as uh, uh, contagious and as uh, severe in terms of the cases. There is no government data here yet. You heard her refer to the Kaiser uh, Health Foundation. That's a private in in institution. And they're also basing a lot of the data that they're getting on foreign countries, other countries' data. So I think a lot of people are asking the question, where is the government's own data about cases here in the U.S.? And we haven't heard that just yet, Allison. All right. So, Mike, given all of this, we know the president's giving a speech tomorrow on vaccines. Uh, give us a preview if you can. What do you know? What's he expected to focus on? Well, what's so interesting is that as the, the White House has been encouraging Americans for months to get these vaccines, we're a long way from the time when there wasn't enough supply uh, and people were uh, certainly high demand for it to now where there is too much supply, frankly, and not enough demand. One of the things that White House officials are, are sensing here is that all the incentives that were offered 
in the last few months weren't as effective as the fear of the Delta variant. But another thing that we're starting to see is mandates not coming from the federal government. And this White House is loath to even talk about potential mandates coming from the federal government. But private businesses, local school districts, local governments are starting to impose these uh, private businesses on their workforces as well. So that is certainly something that's interesting. But as the White House advised the speech that the president's going to give tomorrow, they talked about the importance of vaccinating both here at home, but also around the world. So we should expect to hear the president talk about additional steps that this administration is taking to make sure that other countries are seeing vaccination spikes as well. Because as we've been talking about this Delta variant, we have to remember that Delta variant was initially the India variant. That's where this, case, this, this variant emerged from, and that's a country with a very low vaccination rate still. All right, big week uh, in, in vaccinating uh, Americans. Big news out of the White House. Let's see what the president has to say tomorrow. Mike Memley, thank you so much. Thanks, Alice. Verbal smackdowns, even physical altercations. Restaurant workers say customers are really acting out post-pandemic because they're not satisfied with the service. NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule shows us what's going on. Allison, you and I have talked a lot about it over the last year. This pandemic has been devastating for restaurants. Millions of workers got laid off over the course of the last year. But now that we are out and about and going out to eat again, a new problem has arisen angry, impatient, sometimes even violent customers who are going after their waiters, waitresses, and restaurant owners. A violent altercation at a McDonald's in Indiana, a customer spitting on a hostess in San Jose, even a brazen dine and dash attempt in New Jersey. We're seeing it across the country, unruly customers acting out, and restaurant workers say they're fed up yelling and said this was the worst coffee ever. It's a verbal smackdown. Took the food, dumped it out of the to-go bag. At the Clayton Anchor restaurant in Cape Cod, drunk guests turned abusive when owner Felicia Pons asked them to leave on the 4th of July. Lots of really terrible words that you shouldn't say to a female. They later snuck through the kitchen door past security. By the time he got here, they were already ripping this entire pantry down here, uh, throwing mustard on the ground. The run-in rattled her. We've definitely had circumstances where people are very unhappy. I've never had someone try and break into my restaurant like that before and actually do some damage. Her server, Dana Olette, says people simply don't understand the situation. We're understaffed and we're, we're trying as hard as we can to make everyone happy. Nationwide, customer satisfaction is hitting new lows. 43% reported being frustrated with staffing shortages. 66% were concerned about increasing prices. And 50% say masking wasn't being enforced. It's kind of this perfect storm of things that are happening. Just down the street, Apt Cape Cod closed their doors for a day of kindness. There's still so many people that are grateful to be back, but the ones that aren't are like indignant about what they want and what they deserve. The solution, experts say, is an exercise in empathy. Expect that you're going to have some weights. There's no reason to make someone cry because your burger took longer than you thought it should. Just relax. Can you remember what it was last year? Try to show a little empathy. <laughs> because tipping with gratitude is always free. Now, Allison, you know this. COVID is on the rise, and in certain parts of the country, new restrictions are being put in place. So that means things are likely going to get worse before they get better. So for those who are going out to eat, it's a good time to remember that kindness does go a long way. The White House doubling down on a promise to thousands of Afghans, launching a program to help them resettle in the U.S. as the Taliban advances across Afghanistan. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby has more. Allison, today the State Department announced that they were creating a new category for Afghans looking for refugee status in the wake of the ongoing Taliban offensive in that country. This new category is called P2 or Priority 2. Now, these are individuals who worked for, in some capacity, the U.S. government, whether it was the military or the State Department, but don't necessarily qualify for the special immigrant visa that we've heard so much about in recent, in recent weeks. One of the categories of the special immigrant visa is 
is you have to have served for the U.S. government for at least two years, and you have to have a very specific employment verification. That's one of the things that's causing some of the, uh, some Afghans a difficult time of getting their SIV process approved. Well, now with this new P2, many of those individuals and others who don't qualify can now apply to be refugees. But there's one huge difference in these, these programs here, Allison, and that is the P2 applicants have to leave the country on their own with their families and then begin the process. State Department officials said earlier today that that process can last a year or more. So those Afghans will have to leave, go to another country and pay for themselves to live there for a year or more before they'll even be eligible to come here to the United States. Now, this all comes after some news over the weekend of a civilian massacre down in Kandahar province. It happened in a place called Spin Boldak. About two or three weeks ago, the Taliban ran through that area. They took it over. Well, the Afghan security forces, uh, they, they made an offensive to try to take back the area several days later, but they were not successful. Once they retreated, the Taliban came in and any civilians who were seen cheering on the Afghan security forces or who, who were known to have supported the Afghan government, well, many of them were taken out and executed. The U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan today put out a statement and said that these these actions could constitute war crimes and is, is calling on the international community to hold the Taliban leadership responsible for them and to investigate whether, in fact, these were war crimes committed here. Allison. Thousands of tourists forced to evacuate Turkey as deadly wildfires continue to rage there. Sky News correspondent Alex Crawford quite literally in the line of fire as she filed this report. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Water. Look at this fire that's just a spark has just landed right next to us. Um, and you, that shows just how quickly it can catch a hold. We've just come from down that road. Look at that road. It's now getting overwhelmed by fire at the end of that road is a small village of uh, several thousand people um, from Chukhetme, which is uh, near Bodrum. And just within the space of the last 20 minutes or so, the fire has engulfed the whole of our rear um, road and has come up along the side and is threatening to overwhelm this area. There was mass panic in the village with dozens and dozens of people racing to get out of the area, including the firefighters. Uh, truckloads of firefighters pulling out. Now we arrived there first thing this morning and these strong winds are part of the reason why it is um, really gathering pace. Um, let's move a bit further down Kevin because it's coming further behind us and I don't want to get cut off but um, just keep going if you can. Um, and there was a, a lot of panic in the village as we were there. You can see it's, it's coming down the sides of the, the hill there. There was a lot of panic in the village because they were pretty much on their own. There wasn't uh, firefighters. Uh, we arrived as they were actually taking bottles of water and pulling out buckets of, of water from their wells and trying to douse the flames and protect their property. Uh, a few firefighters turned up. There was a lot of complaints about why there were so few of them. And uh, of course, we know that from the Turkish president that he has said the country does not have enough uh, aircraft to carry water to contain this. And they are being outpaced by the fire, completely outpaced by the flames and the fire. You can see because of these strong winds, maybe we should uh, think about moving on in a few minutes it is moving at a rapid pace if you look down there that's the way where we're going and we don't want to be cut off as i say people have been look at the sheets of flames this is what we're up against small money a big problem for republicans at least until recently for the first time the gop is closing the online fundraising gap with democrats nbc news senior digital politics reporter alex seitzwald joins me now alex gop strategist matt gorman told you this is the harvest of the seeds of digital infrastructure republicans have been planting for years how did they close the gap 
Well, the short answer is Donald Trump uh, for two reasons. Number one, he yeah. came into the Republican Party in the uh, you know Republican primary back in 2016 with a huge army of supporters online. And we've now become very familiar with them. That was unusual for Republicans. Uh, and the second reason is that while he was in the White House and he was pre he was a leader of the Republican Party, he really leaned on officials to unite behind one online giving platform, uh, this thing called Act Red excuse me, WinRed, uh, which they've mm -hmm. been trying to do for years to match the, the Democratic version of which is called Act Blue. And the reason that's important is it, it's kind of like Amazon for giving to candidates. It stores all your information so you can give really easily to different candidates. Even if you only gave to one last election cycle, you'll still be in there to give to this election cycle. So with that, they've dramatically improved their online fundraising. And that new group, WinRed, has uh, raised $2.3 billion with a B since it launched in 2019. Wow. Uh, Alex, you said it. We wouldn't even be having this conversation if not for Donald Trump. But even out of office and without social media, he is still raising massive amounts of money. Let's talk about uh, what his war chest is looking like these days and where that money's coming from. Yeah, we just found out about this because uh, the way his political groups work is they only have to file with the FEC uh, twice a year. And so we just got the results for the first half of the year. And he's sitting on one hundred and two million dollars. Uh, that's after he brought in 82 million for the first half of the year. That includes some transfers from other committees. And that's totally unprecedented for a former president uh, and clearly a sign that he's looking to not be a former president again and to get back into the political arena. You know, he's, yeah. he's been endorsing in uh, midterm elections. He's been endorsing Republican primaries. So it's a sign yeah. that he very much wants to keep a political uh, foot in the door. Yeah. And if anything points uh, or nods to a 2024 run, a pile of cash sure does. Uh, individual donors, Alex, are powerful. We know that. But there are also some downsides here. Could you hit us with the cons of bringing all your money in from small donations? Yeah, I mean, you know, we romanticize uh, the idea of small donors, and there's a lot to be said about them. You don't have to rely on, on corporations and, and wealthy people. Uh, but just as, you know, small donors kind of came around in the, the early 2000s, just as the Internet was taking off, and, and just as we thought Facebook was kind of harmless uh, around 2004, and now we're starting to have some more questions about it, the same thing is happening with small donors, because the same dynamics that make Facebook uh, potentially problematic for democracy, the, the, the emphasis on virality and uh, controversy and, you know, saying shocking things to get attention, the same thing applies to small donors. The kinds of candidates who typically do best with small donors are the, the loudest Loudest, the most extreme, the ones who get the most attention. Uh, so in the in the first quarter of this year, Marjorie Taylor Greene was the number one recipient of small dollars in the House of Representatives. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was number two. Uh, so there's clearly a formula now that a lot of politicians are following where they know that if they're outrageous, if they're extreme, if they get a lot of attention, they can turn that into money. And it just fuels this kind of culture of outrage, uh, not just around an election, but any time of year, because you can raise money any time of year. And so there's some growing concerns that, you know, maybe this isn't all uh, chalked up to be, because it'll just make us even more divided. Yeah, if you're outrageous and you're extreme, you can rake in some big bucks. Uh, Alex Seiswald, always love having you on. Thank you so much for joining us again today. Thanks for having me. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.